This afternoon, I want to speak to you under the heading of the broken curse. And I hope that in this final presentation that I will make at this camp meeting, that I'll be able to present an understanding of the whole, the whole a concept of the whole problem of sin and its solution that will commend itself to our understanding and that you will find to be scriptural. There are some fundamental things that we need to understand. There are some foundations, some building blocks. Those of us who have been, who like to, to fool around with, with a little building or anything that you, you're going to make, you know that right at the beginning you have to lay the foundation because whatever the shape the foundation takes, the building is going to come up on that basis. It's going to take the same shape as the foundation that you lay. And that is why we have so many different ideas in Christianity. In fact, all of us are familiar with the, the statement by the Catholic Church that the doctrine of the Trinity is the foundation of all her beliefs. And we believe that if you can trace every doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church back to its source, you'll find that it was because of the Trinity why this particular aberration came up. This is why, no matter how small it may appear to be, every deviation from a correct understanding of truth is never harmless. It always has consequences somewhere down the line. It affects the way you think, and what affects the way you think affects what you believe, and what you believe affects your experience because we are the products of our belief. We don't rule our beliefs. Our beliefs rule us. That's the fact of life that nobody has ever been able to overthrow, overturn, or counteract. So, there are some fundamental things that I'd like to, 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 to share with you this afternoon. And I'd just like you to look at them and consider them from the basis of, of Scripture. I know that pride is a bad thing, but I don't think it's wrong to take pride in your work. And one of the things that I take pride in is that more and more, I am depending on the Bible. Amen. And if the Bible says it, and you can prove the Bible wrong, then I'm wrong. But if you can't prove the Bible wrong, I'm on solid foundation because I'm not going where the Bible does not go. You know, some time ago when I began to share on the subject of righteousness by faith, somebody uh, began to question me concerning some aspects of what I was teaching. And when I began to explain my understanding of the, the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer, the person says, you know what you're saying sounds a bit metaphysical. And for him, this was a reason to be cautious about what I was saying. So, I never looked in the dictionary because I think I have a fairly good understanding of what the word means. But, if you think of the word metaphysical, it means beyond the physical. Basically, something that is not limited by the laws of physics. You mean like walking on water? You mean like speaking in a language that you never heard? You mean like something that is corrupt becoming righteous? Well, if, you, if that is what metaphysical means, then I, I, I am guilty. If the religion of Christianity is not metaphysical, if it is not a supernatural thing, if it is simply something that can be explained and experienced in terms of physics and the laws of physics, then I don't think there's any need for miracles in Christianity. But my understanding of the difference between the spiritual world and the physical world makes me believe that Christianity is entirely, true Christianity is a supernatural thing. It has to do with what is physical, what is of the earthly plane, encountering something out of, beyond, greater than this world, inexplicable by the laws and the principles that we, we, we operate with on this plane. That's what Christianity is. That's why God has to intervene. Because man is not capable of making himself divine. So that's one of the fundamental things. Now I want to start by going to a verse in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13. And you know, I believe that what I have to share today is beautiful truth. I am praying that our Father might help me to present it in its clarity. One of the problems I have is that when I come up here, and I have my notes on a piece of paper. Sometimes 
I start talking and then at the end I realize I left out so much. But then if I leave the people alone sometimes, I still leave out so much. And if I follow the people, everything gets mechanical like a lecture. And I don't want that. So I'm asking God to give me the balance that I can make my point and still make it in a way that it not only reaches your intellect but your heart. Galatians 3 and verse 13. It says here, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. It's not possible to mistake what is said here. It's possible to misunderstand what it means. But it says Christ redeemed us from a certain curse, and it is called the curse of the law. If you take it as it reads, it, it means that we were under a curse. Christ redeemed or bought us back from this curse. And how did he do it? He did it by himself becoming a curse. And Paul proves his point by saying, The Bible says, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. And he says, Christ hung on a tree, therefore he was cursed. Therefore he bore the curse. And that is the way he delivered you from the curse. If you don't understand what the curse is that came upon you, how it came upon you, then you cannot begin to understand how Christ took the curse, thereby delivering you from the curse. I was reading through this verse and it came upon me. A curious, curious questions came to my mind. What is a curse? What does it mean that I was under the curse of the law? The good law. What does it mean, the curse of the law? And how did Christ take this curse, thereby delivering me from it? Now, I read through the Bible, I began to look at some places in the Bible where it talks about this curse. And I came to the conclusion that a curse is a sentence of disaster. Now you don't need to read the Bible to do this, to know this. If you even have read stories coming up as a child, you always read about somebody being cursed and then all kinds of bad things begin to follow them. This idea is one that is also carried out in the Bible. This idea is, is also true in the Bible. In fact, you remember the case of Balaam. Balak sent for Balaam to do what? Curse Israel. Curse Israel. Balaam was aware that everything that Israel did succeeded. And he, recognizes that, he recognized that he could never defeat this people. So he sent for Balaam and he said, listen, curse this people for me. Because if they were cursed, he knew he could defeat them. Because when you are cursed, bad things begin to happen. But you know, every time Balaam opened his mouth, blessings came out. Not curse. Not curses. And this tells me something else. It tells me that a curse is not something that somebody can really put upon you. Nobody can put a curse on you. A person can express a curse, but he can't put a curse upon you. Let me tell you what, I, let me explain what I mean. Go to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew 23. Let me read very quickly verses... 33 and downwards. But here's what Jesus says. Speaking to the, the Jews. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall you scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias the son of Barachias, whom ye slew between the porch and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. He says in verse 38, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Never was there a more solemn, a more... A more terrible curse pronounced upon a people this was a curse but who was it that cursed Israel Jesus spoke the words but who cursed Israel Israel cursed themselves Christ never cursed them was it Christ who was the result of these disasters coming up, coming up on them it was their own actions that cursed them all Christ did was express the truth. 
Somebody might pronounce a curse upon you, but he doesn't curse you. He only expresses the truth of what will happen. If somebody with a prophetic voice under the divine impulse expresses a curse, what he's doing is telling you what is going to happen. He's not bringing it upon you. That's the first thing to recognize about a curse. When a curse comes upon a person, you know, we're we are familiar with the stories about witches and wizards and how they curse somebody and they bring a curse upon them. But that's not the biblical concept of a curse. In the Bible, a curse is somebody expressing the consequences of your actions. Not somebody bringing something upon you. Although Jesus might say, I will bring this upon you. You understand what he's saying is that your own actions are, the result, are going to result in this. Let me, show, let me give you another illustration of what I mean. Go to Genesis chapter 9. Here we find something happening. Noah, after the flood, became drunk and lay in his tent naked. And the Bible says that his son, his youngest son, Ham, went in, saw his father's nakedness. The Bible doesn't tell you exactly what he did, but the suggestion is that he mocked his father, saw his father's nakedness, and mocked him, laughed at him. Verse 24 says, And Noah awoke from his wine, and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan! A servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. So Noah awoke and cursed Ham, didn't he? No, he didn't. No, he didn't. Look at the verse again. What did Noah do? No, he didn't either. I'm at verse 25. Okay, I know I'm kind of tricking you a little bit. I'm not tricking you. I'm showing you that you read carelessly. Genesis 9 and verse 25 says, And he said, Cursed be who? Amen. Canaan. Who was it that came and looked at him? Ham. Ham. <laughs> who was Canaan? He was the son of Ham. Mm -hmm. Ham did something and Noah pronounced a curse upon the son of Ham. Now this would be so unreasonable and unfair if you think that it was Noah who brought the curse upon Canaan. But he didn't. There's a principle in the Bible that I want to outline to you that, that I want us to understand thoroughly. God says that he visits the iniquities of the fathers upon whom? Upon the children. To the second and the third generation of them that hate me. Third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Now, is it God who arbitrarily decides, how hard you have done something wrong? I'm going to curse KK. And when KK has children, they are going to be cursed. And when her children have children, they are going to be cursed as well. Is that the way God is? No. So what does, does Noah mean? Pronouncing, we believe, under the inspiration of God's spirit, pronouncing a curse upon Noah's son. What is the reason for it? What, what do all these verses mean? Simply this, there's a rule of life that is inescapable and it's called the law of consequences. Consequences. God may, may pardon the penalty of a, what a person does, but consequence continues. What you do affects your children. If you, if you happen to go out and, and pick up AIDS, for example, and you say, God forgive me, but you have a child. Are you, are you pass it on to your husband? You think because you're forgiven, your husband is not going to get, the, the sickness is going to stop? Or your child is going to be miraculously no longer having AIDS? The consequences continue. Now what, what, what God saw in Ham was that this boy has something in his character. And that character trait was going to be passed on to his son. So the curse fell upon Canaan, not because God arbitrarily decided to punish Canaan, but because something that God saw in Ham's character, Ham's nature, passed on to his son, it was transmitted to the next generation. In fact, God says it goes on to the third and fourth generation. And how far does it really go? I look at my four parents in Africa because I'm black. 
And black people, you know, it seems like they have been slaves and, and, and mistreated and they have suffered the worst kind of way on this planet. You have had slaves all through history, but it, nothing seems to have followed any, any nation as, as much as it has followed the black race. I suppose as a black person, I'm more acutely aware of that. But where did it start? It wasn't my fault or my four parents' fault, but we all descended from the generation of Ham, from the line of Ham. Ham took a course contrary to God. He led his children in that course. They went southward into Egypt, into Africa. They took a course that it is said that Nimrod was a part. Nimrod, not it is said. The Bible shows that Nimrod was a part of Ham's lineage. Established a system and a kingdom that was in direct rebellion against God. It went from father to child. And, and, and as the knowledge of God became less and less, they became more degraded. Till they began to worship stones and trees and pieces of wood. Where does it stop? When you are born in a, in a, in a land where people eat people as a, part, as a natural way of life. Where the only God you know is a stone. Where betrayal, where the, 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 the most degrading aspects of human nature are commonplace and are the normal way of life. What hope do you have of ever breaking the cycle? It only gets worse. So the curse is consequence. And that's one thing we need to understand that when God does not, normally speaking, God does not interfere with consequence. He may forgive the penalty, but consequences forgive, uh, continue. And life teaches us that this is the way it is. Now there's something interesting about what God says. Because he says, unto the third and fourth generation of what? Yes. Them that hate me. Do you hear an element of hope in that statement? In other words, you know, when I was a boy and I used to read stories about curses. In fact, I don't need to tell you about that. Let's look at what the Bible says. Let's look at... Um, Genesis, Genesis again. Let me see, I have to find it here because it's not on my paper, but I'll find it very quickly. Um, Genesis 27. Now in this chapter, Jacob came to his father. And the strange thing is that he came to his father by deception and he stole something that belonged to his brother. By deception and, and, and trickery. Now I know that God overruled because the way Jacob went about it, he should never have gotten a blessing. But you see, a blessing is simply a prophecy of what will happen. So when Isaac blessed Jacob, Isaac didn't put that blessing on him. God worked through that whole situation and made a prophecy concerning Jacob and it was fulfilled. Don't think that it was Isaac why Jacob was blessed. But Isaac was the instrument who was expressing the prophetic eye and telling what would happen in the future. So Esau comes in afterwards and he finds that the blessings are all gone. He says, Father, bless me. Don't you have even one blessing for me? And Isaac searches around and he can't think of anything else good to say because he has said everything on the head of Jacob already. Anyway, listen to what he says in verse... In verse 40. He says to Esau. And by thy sword shalt thou live. And shalt serve thy brother. And it shall come to pass. When thou shalt have the dominion. That thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. How do you break a curse? How do you break the dominion of another person? God, what, what, what God says to Esau, what God said to Esau through Isaac is, when the day comes that you are able to break Jacob's dominion off your neck, you shall be free from this curse. Now you know how it is, because you have read stories. And the Bible shows you that in order to break a curse, you have to take its power and defeat that power. That's the only way you can break a curse. In other words, if I want to apply this to the African race. 
If it were possible for one little man worshipping stone and wood, half naked out there in, the, in Africa, 600, 700 years ago, if it were possible for one man to have come to the knowledge of the true God, what would have happened to his children? The curse would have been broken. There would have arisen in the midst of dark Africa a tribe of people in the midst of all this darkness who were totally different from the others. In them, there would have been manifested the purity and the righteousness of true Christianity in the midst of this darkness. It needed one person to break the curse. You see what I'm saying? But how could somebody growing in those circumstances break free from that? Somebody grown and bred in that situation could never break out of it. Not unless, not unless, some new element was introduced into his experience. You see what I'm saying? That is why, even though slavery is such an abhorrent thing, I think I, I was happy that my four parents became slaves. Rather than that, Africa, I, that they should have stayed in Africa and I never have heard about Christ. They came here under the, they came to the, 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 the Caribbean under these terrible conditions. But it gave an opportunity for my people to be exposed to the gospel and because of it today I am where I am. So, so the circumstances brought a change. Some new element came into that depraved life of harm. And so that curse is not on me. That curse is not passed on. Those consequences have been broken because some new element came into my experience. You see what I'm saying? Amen. Now, this is not to say slavery was good by any means. I'm saying that God works through a bad thing as he's always doing to bring a good result. Now, the Bible says that Jesus took the curse of the law. It says... Well, what is this curse of the law? Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 28. What is this curse of the law? Proverbs 28. All right, Proverbs 28 and verse 9. It says, are you there? It says, He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law... Even his what? Prayer. Prayer shall be an abomination. Now what is an abomination? Sometimes you have to take these words and dissect them and think about what they mean to get the full meaning. The Bible says that if you turn away your ear from hearing the law of God, even your prayer. Now an abomination is, if, if, if something is abominable to me, how near do you think I go to it? One of the things I detest is homosexuality. And if I know a homosexual is sitting beside me, I'm getting up and changing my seat. I am that much homophobic. Mark says he doesn't tolerate it. I'm worse. You could have been a Jamaican. But anyway, I, 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 I mention it because when I think of all the things that I, I find hateful, that one always comes to my mind. I abhor it so. Now to me, that is an abomination. Now the Bible says that the man who turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his Prayer is an abomination. If his prayer is an abomination, what do you think about the person himself? What this says to me is that the curse of the law, the curse that comes upon a person, comes upon a person when? When does the curse of the law come upon a person? When he breaks it. In fact, I shouldn't be asking you this question until we look at the verse itself. Go back with me to, to, to Galatians. Galatians chapter 3. Man, I see that lunch sitting down on you. And I see it on your eyes. I hope you're able to <laughs> deal with it. Because I, what I have to say is so important. Back to chapter 3 of Galatians. Verse 10. Look at what it says. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. Why? Look at what it says. For it is written. And the word for tells you that he's now giving the reason why he says it. Isn't that right? For it is written. Cursed is everyone that what? Does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. 
So therefore, it says that if you set out to do the law, and you do not continue in what? In what? All! All things. It means all. In fact, you know it ties in with all scripture because the Bible says, Whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in what? What is the result? So therefore, it doesn't matter if you are keeping the Sabbath today and you have never killed anybody. Jesus says if you even look at a woman to lust at her or you are even angry with your brother, you are a murderer. And immediately you become guilty of how many? All. all. But the Bible says the one who does not continue in all that is written in the law, what is his condition? He is cursed. So I'm telling all you people, all you who are justified by law, you have no way to escape the curse. All who hope to become righteous by way of the law, you are under the curse. Not because I say so, but the scripture says it in plain black and white here in verse 10. As many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. That method, that means of obtaining life is a dead end street. Now, the Bible says that Christ took the curse of the law. He, he took the curse of the law because we were under the curse of the law. And that's simple and straightforward. What it means? It means that somehow, some way, at some time, we have broken the law. If you broke it once, you are guilty of how many? All. So therefore, immediately you come under the curse. And what is the curse that comes upon you when you are guilty of all? What is the curse that comes upon you? Death? Yes. But not only death. We're going to move on a little bit. And let's see what the curse was. Go to the book of Genesis. I think we need to look a little deeper now. And we're coming to the second great fundamental. The second great fundamental. But let me give you the first great fundamental before we come to the second one. Here's the first great fundamental. We all know this truth. In fact, I want to put a, a little, just draw a line on the board. And if I can, try to illustrate what I'm saying. Very crudely, but... Jesus says in Matthew 19 and verse 17 that there is none good but one. This is God. Now I don't know if you believe that or you don't believe it. It's repeated in Revelation chapter 15 and verse 4 where it says that thou only, referring to God, the beings around the throne sing, thou only art holy. Only means that there is no other. Matthew 19 and verse 17, Jesus says, There is none good but one. In fact, Mark read yesterday from Romans chapter 3 and verse 10 that there is none righteous. No, not one. Paul is not dealing with God there because otherwise he would have said, There is none good, no, not one, except God. God alone is good. Any place in this universe, if you believe what the Bible says, any place you find true good, what have you found? You have found God. You have found where God abides. If you find goodness. If you find goodness outside of God, then there's more than one God. Because God alone is good. That's a fundamental principle. And if you don't understand this, nothing that you believe concerning righteousness is going to be correct. That's one of the foundation stones. You can't find it anywhere but in God. So here's a universe that God made at the beginning. Here's a universe. And what is the condition of this universe? Good. It is good. And he creates a world. And what is the condition of the world? It is very good. So you know that in it, there is very God. You know that God has designed this world to be an expression of himself. He has designed it to be a place through which his life will flow and be manifested in every thorn, in, no thorns, in every tree, every leaf, every bud, every flower. And the living, intelligent beings become temples, dwelling places for the living God. Their bodies are the temple of the living God, and he lives and expresses himself through these people. That's how he created this world and designed it. In this condition, everything was good. I don't need Bible to prove that to you, do I? Now the serpent comes along. In fact, Lucifer introduced something into the universe, right? For the first time, Lucifer divided the universe into two. It was not a physical division. 
It was an ideological division. What idea did Lucifer introduce into the universe? He introduced the idea that it was possible to live better without God. Now I don't have to tell you this because we all read Genesis seat and said to the woman, God is not telling the truth. God knows that if you eat of the tree in that day you shall become what? Like God. And the essential element that, made their life, that, that God brought into their lives was that they were good. He was trying to say to them, you don't need God to be good. All you need to do is to know right and wrong. You shall become like God knowing good and evil, right and wrong. All you need is the knowledge of right and wrong. And if you have this, you do not need God. I told you the other day, this is the basic foundation of every false religion on this planet. The idea that all you need is moral education and you can do the rest. It is, it is not the truth. It is absolutely false. Every false religion builds on that principle that if you have the right moral education, you already have the equipment to be good. It is not true. God alone is good. And without God, Jesus says in, 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 in John 15 and verse 5, without me, what? You can do nothing. Sure you can walk. Sure you can smile. Sure you can eat food. He's not talking about the, 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 the ability to function physically. He's talking about moral ability. You can do nothing without him. So, the person who begins to seek for righteousness must begin to seek for God. Not within himself. If you believe that you can search it inside yourself and find something good, you are living in a dream world. You are living an illusion. It never will happen. What you will find is a, is a, a deception. What you will find is a lie. Something that you think is really righteousness. But you don't have it at all. Something like the scribes and Pharisees had. You could never tell them that they were not righteous people, could you? They thought they were the creme de la creme, the best of the crop, because they kept the commandments. And they kept the commandments while they were crucifying the Son of God. And they were so anxious that his body should not remain on the, 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 the cross on the Sabbath, so they could keep the law while they were murdering their only hope of righteousness. That's what... This kind of self-deception does to people. It makes you think you are so righteous when truly you are breathing in. You are imbibing, you are expressing nothing but the principles of Satan himself. So we need to understand these foundations, brothers and sisters. When Adam and Eve partook of the fruit, God promised them something. I'm coming back to the board in a little while. But God told them that if you eat of the fruit, what will happen? Now, God does not tell lies. God does not lie. If God said you shall die, it's the truth. And God says, in the day that you eat, in that day you shall die. Adam lived to be 930 years before he died. We kind of just kind of gloss over that part and think, well, I don't know, maybe God changed his mind. You see? What most people do is consider what God says as God cursing them. But remember what we said about a curse. God does not curse anybody. What does he do? He expresses, predicts what is going to happen. When God said you shall surely die, he was not saying if you take I will cut your throat. Absolutely not. What he was saying, if you take, you are going to bring something into your experience that is going to kill you. You don't know what it will do. I'm warning you my people. Don't go near that tree. Because if you do. Something will enter your life. That will destroy you. You will die. He warned them in love. So they said. We don't think you are telling the truth. This snake. Seems to have what it takes. And so they went and they took the fruit. Now one thing that you can tell as you study the Bible, is that God does not remain where he's not wanted. What happens to a person when he turns away from God? The Bible says that his very prayer does what? 
it becomes an abomination. The moment Adam deliberately, knowingly, consciously chose that he did not want God, his entire being became an abomination to God. His prayers even became an abomination. What it means is that God had to turn away from Adam. You notice that Adam did not die that day, but he died in a certain sense, didn't he? He died spiritually. And so the Bible says of us, what does the Bible say is our spiritual condition? We are dead in trespasses and sins. There's that word dead. We are dead in trespasses and sins. This came upon Adam that very day because that very day he separated himself from God. And when you are separated from God, how much good is there in you? Zero. Because God alone is good. Our goodness is not based on what we learn. Our goodness is based upon who is living in us. Amen. Brothers and sisters, this is the great difference between true righteousness and the counterfeit. False righteousness tells you it is what you do, how you develop, how you move along in life. True righteousness re recognizes that it is a gift Amen. of God himself and there is no other way. So what? You don't see God with your eyes. So you don't see righteousness and it comes and jumps into your heart. Are you telling me that because you cannot see it is a lie? If you could see it, then where would be the need of faith? Amen. But God says believe, not because you see, but because I say so. Because God told Adam and Eve that you will die. And they said, we don't believe you. And God says, I can't go forward with planet Earth unless you will believe me. And so God says, if you will believe, I will deal with you. So faith becomes the foundation of the Christian life. So what I'm saying brothers and sisters. Was that spiritual death passed upon Adam that day. And when it passed upon Adam. The curse did not come only upon Adam. But God says to what? To the children. To the third. And fourth generation. Of them that hate me. Now here is a dilemma, brothers and sisters. I'm going to go to the board, and I hope you all can see the board. Now over this side, Adam introduced something that we will call evil. Adam introduced evil. But good still existed in the universe. Now anything that is on this side where you see good, it possesses what? The life of God. Anything on this side, what is its condition? There's no life in it. It does not have the life of God. The Bible says dead in trespasses and sins. In fact, the Bible tells us about this side that this, these people are carnal. And the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God. And it cannot be. Now man was over here. And Lucifer and his angels were here. But when Adam made a choice, he transferred himself over to this side. Now according to what the Bible says, According to what the Bible says, the people who are on this side, even their prayers are an abomination to God. Now I need to say something before I go one step further. In the Garden of Eden, something happened. The moment Adam sinned, what stepped between him and death? Christ! Christ. The Bible says of Jesus Christ that he's a lamb slain from when? From the foundation of the world. So the moment man sinned. He began to receive the benefits of Christ's death. And because of this. We don't understand. What is man's true sentence. Do you want to know what man. What should have happened to man in the garden. Take a step. A few years down the future. And take yourself to the time. When the spirit of God is withdrawn from the earth. The Bible says that in those days. They blasphemed the God of heaven. But what? They repented not of their sins. Why don't they repent? God is not there and they cannot repent. They have no desire to turn to God. Their probation is closed. They have no benefit, no grace, no light from God. They cannot turn to God. Now do you know that that is where Adam and Eve should have been that day? That's what they chose. Why did God continue to bring blessings to the human race because Christ's sacrifice intervened and because Christ intervened 
We don't recognize exactly where we should be, so we don't know what is the full extent of the curse because all along the way, we have never had the full extent of the curse resting on humanity. Not until probation closes. The people who go through the last seven plagues will experience the wrath of God poured out without mixture. They will understand what it means to be under the curse. And the Bible says that they will not be able to repent. They will seek for death and not be able to die. Because God will turn away from mankind without Christ in between. So we were benefiting from Christ's, Christ's sacrifice from the very beginning. And this is why we don't know. Now, now I'm going to get on to the real critical part of this that I'd like you to pay close attention to. Now, here you find that man put himself on this side. Now let's look at humanity outside of Christ. Because Christ came to do something for humanity. But, but without Christ, this thing that he did does not exist. Let's look at humanity's condition as it, as it was and as it had to be if we are going to really understand what Christ did. When a person moved from the good side over to the evil side, every one of his children is born over here. Is that right? How do you break the curse? By going back to the other side. Somebody has to come this side. But is it possible? What, can, is it possible for anybody to move from the left side, the evil side, to the good side? Why? Because the person over here is without God. And nobody without God can choose good. So humanity is in a hole. And Satan felt sure that he had us. Satan, Satan felt sure that once we accepted his principle, the principle of independence of God, he felt sure that we were his forever. And right in the garden, God said something that filled him with a strange fear. God says, the seed of the woman will bruise your head now what is the head of Satan what is the head of the snake that Jesus was going to bruise it represents his principles his philosophies the foundation on which his government is going to be built, be built. God says in the garden the seed is going to crush your head and Satan feels a fear in his heart because he knows that although he thinks that everything is settled and he has his world and he has established his government. Something is in the works that is going to bring disaster upon him. So he doesn't know what is going to happen. But what God is saying is that somebody is going to come who is going to break this curse. You know what is interesting to me? I find that as you go through the story of the kings of Israel in the Old Testament, there is something interesting. Every time Israel had, a, had, a, had a, a good king, Israel was good. And every time they had a bad king, Israel became bad. But if you read the Bible carefully, I don't know how many of you ever read through the history of the kings. But what I discovered is that every time there was a good king, you know what was at the root of it? I don't think anybody ever noticed this. I know, I know, I did and it came as a surprise to me. I never heard anybody talk about it. But go back and read. Reformation. There was a reformation. But why were some kings wicked and some good? When they were from the same family, the same tribe coming down. You go back. Look at the mothers. Go back. The Bible tells you the mothers. Ahab's wife was Jezebel. And her mother, her, she was the mother of, I think it was... Omri, was it? But if you look at the mothers, the mothers were good mothers and the, 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 the attitude of the next king was different. When I read it, I was amazed. I, I saw right there the influence of a good mother. Even though the, the king himself was wicked, the mother changed the child. The introduction of something good into the life stream changed what was happening in Israel. And you can go and look at it. But I was reading one day and I became very surprised, very amazed at it. Now, there are a few things that I need to point out. And I, I, I hope 
Man, it's a bad time of day, but I hope we can stay awake. Um, <laughs> now, now, <laughs> the, over here, man was created good, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. Who made that decision? God. God. Did man have the freedom to choose what he was? Yes. No. Not when it's no. God chose for him. He had the freedom to choose evil. But he didn't have the freedom to choose good. Because that was decision, decision was made for him. But there were two forces in the universe, good and evil. Now look at Satan's argument. Why didn't you give them freedom to choose? If you are fair and I said to you that my system works better than yours, why didn't you give them the freedom to choose? You see why God had to put the tree in the garden? God said, let me give you the option to make a choice. But they had a choice to choose evil. They didn't have a choice to choose good. But because God had, had, had created them good against their will or without their input, he now had to give them the freedom to choose. I realize that the whole thing, everything is built on the principle of free choice. Because God is a God who will not rule in a universe where he's not wanted. So he has to build the whole plan of salvation, everything upon the principle of free choice. And if anybody thinks that what I'm saying destroys free choice, you're not understanding. Let me explain properly what I mean. It was built on the principle of free choice. So God gave man free choice. And free choice put man where? On Satan's side. Now if man is to come back to God's side, upon what principle must it be happen? Free choice. God cannot interfere over here. Why? Because man made that choice, right? So God cannot interfere over here. God wants to save man, but he cannot interfere on that side because man chose to be there. And once he's there, can he choose? He cannot choose God. Why? Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. It has no desire for God. We were enemies of God. Aliens, strangers from the commonwealth of Israel. We were nothing of God. And we had no desire to be so on that side. Now I'm looking at this side. And of course I'm saying all of this. And I'm looking at it from the perspective of how it was without Christ's intervention. Because that is reality. That was what happened to humanity. Satan put us... In we chose to put ourselves in a hole not knowing what we were doing. And when we got there, we could not get out. Man, when I was studying this, I said, what a plan. Amen. What a God and what a Savior. I tell you, when I saw it, man, for the first time in my 33 years as a Christian, I realized why Jesus had to die and what he went through. And my heart was lifted up and I realized why only in understanding true righteousness by faith can we ever come into harmony with God's plans. So God gave man this opportunity. Man chose sin and now man had to come back of his own free will. Now, the next principle I want us to understand is, well we already touched on it but I just want to emphasize it because it's important. Is the capacity of one person to decide for everybody. Now, when Adam made the decision, somebody says it is not justice that Adam should make a decision and I suffer for it. It's not a question of justice. If I do something and the judge sentences my son, that is injustice. But if I do something and the consequences pass on to my son and his son, that is not injustice. That is, the, the, that is the reality of how life is. It's not somebody's fault. It's the way nature works. Principle that consequences pass on. You don't escape consequences. Right when I came down here, it was raining the other day. I got, I got wet. Whose fault was that? I walked in the rain. There are consequences, right? And suppose I got a cold and I got pneumonia and died. Was that somebody sentencing me? It was consequences. That's the way life is. These principles, it's the way the universe works. God does not step in and intervene with consequence. He removes penalty. He forgives. So, 
Adam brought these consequences upon humanity and upon all humanity. And when it came upon humanity, the thing is there was no way Adam could, bring, could reverse it. Because now that he was on, side, uh, on the left side, leaving Christ out of the picture, he had no ability to come back on the right side. So everything that was born from Adam on this side, on this left side, everything born over here was doomed to eternal death. That was reality. What God wanted to do now, what did God have to do? Since one man could condemn all humanity, if God could find one single human being who could simply make the choice to come back on this side, if one man could do it, then God could find a way to save one man, couldn't he? Mm -hmm. In fact, the Bible says that the, the, the iniquity is vis visited upon the children to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So if one man could be found who did love God, then human life could come back to this side. Of course, it wouldn't solve the problem fully. Because if one man comes back, how many people can that one man bring back? Himself. Only himself. Right? He doesn't bring back the entire race. But let's begin with first things first. First of all, we are trying to see if God can break the curse for one person. Now what does this person have to do or have to be in order to break the curse? Can you tell me some other things? Good. Huh? Good. He has to be good. Why does he have to be good? Because as all those over here, what is their relationship to God? They are separated from God. And once, as soon as you are separated from God, what is your condition? Evil. So if there is somebody over here who is going to come back, he also has to be in a condition of what? I probably have to say it myself. All right, I'm going a little too fast. I'm going a little too fast. You know, it's interesting that Satan, he has to be born again, Sister Janet. Let, 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 let me, I'm asking you some unfair questions because I, I had to be going through the Bible, sitting in my room, mulling over these thoughts, almost getting it getting back, almost getting it, and finally I got it all together. Any person who is separated from God becomes no good. Who can be separated from God and remain good? Not quite right. Only God. And yet God cannot separate from himself. So who are you looking for? Somebody just like God. That you can take him and separate him from God, yet he remains good. What other qualification does he have to have to, 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 to bring back humanity? Huh? Yeah, he has to be divine. That's, what, that's the point we just made. What other qualification? He has to be human. What kind of human? He has to be on the fallen side. He has to be fallen humanity. My Lord, how perfect. Is the plan. How perfect. You have to be man. Furthermore you have to be man. Not just man. You have to be man under the curse. Amen. And in that condition. Where everybody in the universe fails. You have to succeed. And the only reason you can succeed. Is because you have a new. The one new element of life. Amen. That enables you to break the curse. Hallelujah to Jesus. Amen. God couldn't do it. Nobody could do it. That proves to me again that when God taught me through the Godhead message that Jesus is the true Son of God, it was pure truth. He was taking me step by step to help me to understand greater truth. The truth that Jesus had to be fallen man. Is absolute truth. But don't make it, don't let it take you to the place where you deny that he was absolutely divine. Amen. Because both things have to be true. 
So Jesus came to this earth, and the Bible says he became a curse. But where did he become the curse? On the tree! Now that is something, because some of my friends have been telling me that Jesus took the curse from, the, from his, who was born. And they say the curse is that he was born in, in, in fallen flesh. I don't think so. You know what the Bible says? He bore my sins, 1 Peter 2 and verse 24. He bore my sins in his own body. Where? On the tree. Paul says he was made a curse for us because it is written, Cursed is everyone that what? Hangs on a tree. It was on the tree that he was made a curse. In fact, if you look at that passage where Paul says it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. You go back to Deuteronomy 21 and verse 32, I believe. You know what it says? God says when you hang a man, don't allow his body to remain on the tree all day. Because he that is hanged is a cursed of God. Is a cursed of God. The curse of the law is on him. God turns his back on him. What does it say in Isaiah 53? The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. God brought it upon his son. His son did not deserve it. What did God bring upon him? God turned his back on his son. His son had never broken the law. But God put the curse of the law upon him. Turned his back upon him. And left him alone in the universe. And Satan said, I've got you now. Nobody ever came over to my side that was not defeated. Even though you are the son of God, you are fallen human. And once I have you here, I've got you. Now I realize why it says that God put his son at jeopardy. Because on the cross, God turned his back on Jesus. He put him under the power of Satan, under the full power of the curse, and left him to see if he could make that choice again for humanity. And Jesus, when it came upon him, he never expected it. What did he say? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Satan said, this is it. But at that moment, Satan's kingdom was destroyed. At that moment, he crushed the serpent's head because he took the principle of Satan. And what did he do? He broke the curse. He defied the curse. The curse says you have to choose self without God. And Jesus defied it. As a human being under the power of the curse, he says, I choose God. Think about it. There were two trees that mankind's destiny hung in the balance. One was a living tree, and there Adam chose death. The other one was a dead tree, and there Christ chose life. Amen. At the tree in the garden, Satan said, If you eat, if you obey God, if you disobey God, you will live forever. At the tree on the hill, he said to Jesus, If you obey God, you will die forever. Adam listened to him. Christ defeated him. Christ destroyed his principle. So now, here is a human life that has broken the curse. Here is a life in which Satan's power does not reign. One man is free. What does it have to do with the rest of us? One man has to find a way to take that life. Just like Adam took his defeated life. And pass it on to his children. This one man has to find a way to take his victorious life and pass it on to children. Same principle. That's why he's called the second Adam. So he has to devise a way that people who are already living, who already have life, can receive his life. Infuse this principle into their own bodies and make them into new creatures. He has to find a way. But he cannot do it. And why can he not do it? Because he's only flesh and blood, right? He has to do something. He has to go back to heaven and what? And be glorified. He has to become a living spirit that can pass on his life to others. So he says the first Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit, a life-giving spirit. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter, I'm sorry, chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4.
It says in verse 10. Now he that uh, he that descended. Let me read from verse nine. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Why did Jesus go back to heaven? So that he might fill all things. In fact, Ellen White puts it this way. She says, cumbered with humanity, what? Christ could not be in every place at the same time. He had to go back and come again as the Holy Spirit. Because as the Holy Spirit, he can actually live inside of you. When he was on earth, Jesus could fill one man. And who was that? Jesus Christ. He had to go back and be glorified with the Father so that now he's able to take that life and pass it on to every one of us. So there's one problem that remains. Jesus is now a human being who has chosen God. Jesus now has the ability to become the Father who passes on his life to children. But one other problem remains. Adam began to pass on his life by what means? Procreation. Through sex, Adam's life became divided and passed on from person to person. Jesus cannot pass on his life by sex because the people that he wants to help are already living. Furthermore, he's a spirit, right? So he has to find a way. What is the means by which now this life is going to result in new birth? Faith. faith. By faith. Now he goes back to the same principle of the Garden of Eden. If you will believe God, you shall be born again. Amen. Praise God for the plant. It's wonderful. It's beautiful. And so, by one man, death came upon the human race. And by one man, life came upon all the human race. That will receive it. All who will believe. That is where we are. And you can see when you understand this, brothers and sisters, why it is so tragic when people try to place the plan of salvation upon the basis of human works. <coughs> it is tragic and it is impossible. Before you can do right, you must receive life. Amen. And when you receive life, you will do right. Amen. So, Jesus took the curse, destroyed the curse. And brought humanity back to God. You see, one of the things why people, ha have not, people have not recognized this. Is because ever since Adam fell, nobody ever really experienced the fullness of the curse. Never. Why? Because Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world. We have been receiving the benefits from the beginning. The moment Adam sinned, he never died. Immediately salvation was offered to him because Christ became the lamb slain. We started to get the benefit right away so we don't know exactly where we are. We don't understand exactly what Christ did. But once you understand, you see why there is no way that it is possible for us to do anything good. The person outside of him, there is some grace extended even to the non-Christian. Isn't that right? By the blood of Christ, through the sacrifice of Christ, the ungodly still continues to receive rain. They still continue to receive the impressions of the Spirit of God. So God is still pleading with us. But we cannot do what is right. We cannot do what is right. Our minds desire good. But we are incapable of carrying it out until we are born again. So, I want to thank you brothers and sisters for your attentiveness. In fact, you know, I wish that there were a million people listening to what I have to say today. Amen. I really do. And, I, and not because I'm saying it, but because it is the truth of God. And someday, it is going to bond this planet from end to end. It is going to. This truth and all corollary truths, they are going to surround and cover this earth. And all who believe, embrace and experience these truths will be those who stand finally victorious with the Lord. And that's why I want all of us to understand it. But, you know, there are some who won't. So, 
God bless you all. And I'm glad you were here to, to, to listen. And um, we're going to have that special song by Sister Cheryl now, which I know will bless us even more. Than silver or gold, I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses and land. And I'd rather be led by his nails card hands than to be the king of a vast domain or be Jesus, then any, anything that this world can afford today, I'd rather have Jesus than man's applause. I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause. I'd rather have my Jesus than a worldwide fame. And I'd rather be true. To his holy name, than to be the king of a vast, a vast domain, or to be held in sin's dread sway. Then any, anything that this world can afford today. Sing it with me, everyone. Then to 